Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast, season two. In this episode, we discuss the errors in the indictment in Jeremy's case, which set out the formal charges against him. We explain why and how this was invalid at the time of Jeremy's trial and is an issue which still remains unresolved today. An indictment is a requirement of law in every case which is sent to court and is the formal document accusing one or more persons of a specified offence. In short, an indictment can be described as the Crown's licence to prosecute a case. A person is tried on indictment before a judge and jury in the Crown Court. The most important provisions of this document need to be clear and defined and must include the following. Each offence must be set out in a separate paragraph or count. Each count should be divided into a statement of the offence, setting out the offence and the statute, or in other words the written law, and which section of that law has been broken. The particulars of the offence setting out the details. The indictment should be signed by an officer of the court. Importantly, there are also strict time limits in place from when the indictment is written to the time it is served on the appropriate officer of the court. This time limit stands at 28 days, inclusive of weekends and bank holidays. If any single one of the procedures set out above are not adhered to, then it could be fatal for the prosecution case. At trial, a copy of the indictment is provided to the jury as a tool to assist them in their initial understanding of the case they will have to decide on. And without an indictment, a person cannot be prosecuted. There have been several cases where contraventions to the rules on indictments have, on appeal, resulted in a conviction being quashed. The legal publication, Archbold Criminal Pleading, Evidence and Practice, usually referred to simply as Archbold, is the leading practitioner's text for criminal lawyers in England and Wales and several other common law jurisdictions around the world and has been in print since 1822 with updates made to it frequently. Chapter 1 of Archbold, Section 1, Paragraph 1 and therefore the very first rule of law, states, A criminal trial in the Crown Court cannot start until there is a valid indictment. If an indictment is invalid, then all proceedings thereon, including guilty pleas, will be a nullity. Regina v. Newland In short, this means that if there are any failings to the rules regarding an indictment, The indictment is worthless, not legally binding, and can negate the outcome of the trial, even if a defendant is later found guilty. A trial cannot legally take place without this legal document being submitted within the allocated time frame, and containing all the facts set out in the procedural rules. Even if someone has pleaded guilty to an offence at trial, and if it is discovered at a future date that the indictment was invalid, all the judgments and proceedings thereon become invalid and decisions, including convictions, must be set aside. There are no exceptions. The case referenced in Archbold, page 1, paragraph 1, section 1, is that of that 1988 case, Regina v. Newland. It was discovered that the trial had proceeded on an indictment which was invalid. The reason it was deemed invalid was because the indictment improperly contained offences, also referred to as counts, that were unrelated to the offence which was being tried during the court hearing. The defendant Newland had actually pleaded guilty at his trial, but appealed against his conviction based on the flawed content of the indictment against him. The appeal court judge who addressed the indictment issues ruled that because the indictment was incorrect, as it set out the details of crimes unrelated to those the trial was about, the indictment was incorrectly drafted and as such flawed. This conclusion of the judges led them to make the only decision they could make in law and ruled that the appeal must succeed with the outcome 
therefore, in Newland's favour. Whilst the judges did recognise that there was no evidence of any merit in Newland's appeal, which could have caused his conviction to be unsafe, and that he had, in fact, pled guilty at trial, the judges had no other option but to quash his conviction. A further example where an invalid indictment caused a case to be quashed is Clark and McDade from 2008. Both had been given a 12-year sentence in 1997 for grievous bodily harm with intent. In this instance, the indictment had not been signed despite the clear statutory requirement that it should be, and this resulted in the convictions being quashed by the court. A different example comes in the case Regina versus Leakes in 2009. Leakes had been found guilty of causing death by careless driving and refusing to take a breathalyzer test. Leakes had also returned a guilty plea at trial. Yet on discovery that the indictment was invalid because it had not been signed by an officer of the court, an appeal regarding this was lodged. Yet again, Owing to the errors in this flawed indictment, the case was quashed. In this instance, the appeal judges ruled, in our view, this plea of guilty and the subsequent conviction on the plea and the sentence are all founded on a nullity. We accordingly grant leave to appeal and quash the conviction and sentence. And so, as in the examples above, even if a defendant admits his crime in a court of law, if the indictment is not accurate, or any of the procedures have not been strictly adhered to in its issuance, the conviction has to be quashed. So how is this applicable to Jeremy Bamber? Jeremy Bamber's trial can be shown to have been an illegal undertaking by the Crown, because it too had a flawed indictment. Therefore, upon its discovery, and with a challenge made, to the CCRC regarding this, Jeremy's case should have been referred to the Court of Appeal and the conviction quashed and the verdict nullified. We will now explain the reasons why the Crown did not have a valid indictment to commit Jeremy for trial, let alone sustain his conviction. By examining Archbold at Chapter 1, Section 1, 224, it can be seen that a bill of indictment shall be preferred a. where a defendant has been committed for trial within a period of 28 days commencing with the date of committal. Jeremy Bamber was committed for trial on Wednesday the 7th of May 1986. Therefore, from the date that Jeremy Bamber was committed for trial, the Crown had now a period of 28 days to have the indictment signed by a representative of the court which would allow the Crown to proceed with the prosecution. Jeremy's indictment was signed by Mr Wilson, officer for the Crown Court, on the 4th of June 1986. A simple act of counting the days shows that by the time the indictment was served and signed at the Crown Court to proceed with the trial, it was 24 hours too late and therefore was invalid. In 2004, Jeremy gained access to his indictment and a challenge was immediately made to the Criminal Cases Review Commission on the indictment issue. This was based on an inaccuracy in the charges and the fact that it was signed out of time. The inaccuracy in the charges was that the indictment stated that the date the tragedies occurred was the 7th of August 1985. However, Essex Police had in fact stated that the tragedies must have happened between 10pm on the 6th of August 1985 and on 3.26am on the 7th of August 1985. The police stated that they reached these timings by using the last time anyone outside the property had contact with the occupants, which they stated was the phone call between June and Pamela Bowflower at 10pm on the 6th of August and 3.26am, the time they alleged that Jeremy Bamber telephoned the police. The CCRC responded to this inaccuracy negatively, rejecting the issue, even though it was not correct in law. 
The CCRC also asserted that in respect of the 28-day time limit, a judge of the Crown Court could extend this time period either before or after the period of time had expired. However, this must be done before the trial concludes. In Jeremy's case, the trial judge was not aware that the indictment had expired prior to it being signed when he presided over the trial. The Commission also stated that the rules regarding the indictments are directory and not mandatory, but this is not correct. The rules set out by the Crown Prosecution Service are quite clear and are mandatory, as follows. Rule 14, Section 1, Paragraph 1, requires the prosecutor to serve a draft indictment on the Crown Court not more than 28 days after service of the evidence in a case where the defendant is sent for trial, the committal or transfer of the defendant for trial, a High Court judge gives permission to serve a draft indictment, voluntary bill, or the Court of Appeal orders a retrial, and the Crown Court may extend the time limit even after it has expired. The application to extend the time period was never addressed in Jeremy's case, either before or during the trial. When the Commission brought this issue to the attention of the trial judge, Justice Drake, following the defence argument in 2004, Drake responded in a letter. Drake wrote that had he known the indictment had expired, he would certainly have made a ruling that would have permitted the trial to proceed. However, this is completely irrelevant because the indictment had expired. Therefore, it was not valid at trial and should have been addressed by the judge prior to the conclusion of the trial, not 18 years after the conviction. On the second issue of the date of the shootings being incorrect, based on police evidence, the defence set out that the indictment should not have stated this as occurring on the 7th of August, but should have set out 6th or 7th of August, as the police had claimed. The CCRC responded that the jury could convict even if the date of the offence was different to that written on the indictment, although the Commission said it was desirable to identify the actual date as accurately as possible. The CCRC concluded this issue by stating The Commission does not consider that this issue raises any real possibility that the Court of Appeal would quash Mr Bamber's conviction on the basis of this issue. However, the fact remains that the Crown did not have any legal authority to prosecute Jeremy Bamber because the indictment was signed out of time. It makes no difference whatsoever that the judge later stated that had he known, he would have made a ruling that would have permitted the trial to proceed. That was 18 years too late. And it therefore still stands that the trial of Jeremy Bamber should never have happened. That the verdict was illegitimate. The refusal to allow appeal in 1988 and the full appeal hearing in 2002 are null and void and the conviction of Jeremy Bamber is completely illegal. It is therefore understandable if you ask why the defence team are not currently challenging this issue again at this time. This is an issue which Jeremy's legal team are fully aware of and have considered. However, based on the strength of the comprehensive submissions made to the CCRC in March 2021, it was decided that the indictment issue need not be advanced at this time. The submissions which were made prove that there are multiple factors which demonstrate that Jeremy did not receive a fair trial and highlights points of law relevant to the trial and also prove that Jeremy's conviction is unsafe. This leaves no doubt at all that Jeremy is innocent. Therefore, it's these issues we need the CCRC to concentrate their efforts on at this time. But rest assured that if we need to, we shall return to the CCRC with the indictment issue. You can join our monthly Zoom Facebook meetings, which have a first look at case material, presentations, guest speakers, legal updates and your questions answered.
at our official Facebook, Jeremy Bamber Justice Group.